All right, everybody, welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We are back yet again. We've got three new analysts today. Very exciting. And Brody is wearing a shirt with pineapples. So the, the show, is, which matches the hat really well. So mm. I do mm. respect that. Uh, we've got some interesting topics today. Some from you submitted through our QR code and link in the description. And then some other ones that kind of popped up during the event at Waco. But without further ado, let's inter introduce our guests today. Uh, we've got Brody. Brody's in the house. Yeah, so two things off the top. First, uh, we just pulled a $500 Anthony Richardson autograph. Um, so stoked for, stoked for that. That's pretty much the best card you can pull out of that box. And secondly, I'm starting to, starting to question whether or not this show is just who can say the most stuff versus who can say the stuff that's the most factual. I think that's loser talk. Um, on to Brad. Brad is joining us today. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, joining you from Canada. Um, you guys actually may recognize me from the roast that I received on the off season podcast. I'm the guy oh. who floats between MA three and MA four <laughs> and, uh, I have a garbage rating, so but look forward to the amateur perspective. But if we gave you a much higher guess, that means you looked like you knew what you were doing and that's half the battle oh, yeah. out there for sure. Uh, I was holding up the one. And an ace disc. So there you go. There you go. Um, we're also joined today by Sam. What's up, everybody? I'm Sam. I've been playing disc golf for about four years now. Um, very much an amateur, but I do like facts. So, Brody, you're in for a good one. I got some good facts for you today. Speaking of which, fun oh. fact Brody, you shot a 1043 rated round this weekend. That is your 28th best disc golf round of all time, according to the PDGA. And it's your best round of disc golf since September of 2023 when you shot a 1061 rated round at the MVP open. Wow. Fun fact, I could care less about ratings. All right. Confrontational as always, Brody Smith. Um, and we're, all, <laughs> we're also always joined, we're also joined by, uh, by Ryan today. What's up y'all. My name is Ryan. Uh, I was a pre COVID disc golfer just by a year or so. Um, I am a PE teacher and I love teaching disc golf. I also own a camp and I, each disc golf there too. So uh, it's a lot nice, of fun. Nice. Uh, it's, it's fun uh, teaching some uh, disc golf. That's awesome. All right. We got some exciting guests today. I will say like at this point, it's been so long since like the COVID disc golf boom. That I was going to say, say is, that a, is that a thing? Is that people are like, oh, oh no, yeah. don't, don't, don't mess with me. I'm pre COVID. I'm, pre -COVID. Well, yeah, I'm saying if, if you're pre COVID, <laughs> like if you're, if you're COVID at this point, like if you say I joined with the COVID boom, like you've already been playing for like four years. If you're pre COVID, I mean, you've been playing since the dawn of time. I, mean, I know, but do people like look at you differently by saying that you're COVID? They like, do. You, they do. 1, I think they do. Right. I've had to change my perception though because like i said the last few years if you said you were a covid golfer i was kind of like oh you're new mm. um but now i'm like no you've been playing for quite a long time you're you've been around and i will say this guys that joined during the covid boom uh sometimes some of them are really good athletes and they kick my butt within a year so can't really, really, can't yeah, really say much about that uh, all right we're gonna hop right into it with our first topic here um this one i think is actually quite interesting um gannon burr Coming down 18, throws his upshot. Uh, it was honestly upshot doesn't do it justice. His full powered spike hyzer over the trees uh, to get up and down for the win. He was seen checking his phone, walking up the fairway of 18 to see how far his upcoming putt would be, which I thought was kind of funny. We've occasionally seen guys tune into the broadcast, but this was like literally walking up to his lie. Uh, do you see a potential competitive advantage that could be leveraged when players can access the broadcast? Do you think there is reason for all phone usage to be banned among players and caddies due to pot potential advantages? Why or why not? Brody, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious why this one's getting so much traction because like you just said, we've seen this before. They've even talked about it on pre, uh, previous broadcasts of where it's like you see a player waving to the camera and they're looking at themselves and see. I don't know why this one got a crazy amount. We've gotten a lot of people asking on social media for, uh, you know, should this be allowed? The big issue here is the PDGA and the Disc Golf Network, Disc Golf Pro Tour, have kind of doubled down on making all pros want to use their phones. There's a lot of guys that don't want to use their phones, but now that we have to do PDJ live scoring, yes, you can still do the paper cards, but for the most part, I think you have to have a couple PJ live scorings. I don't think you can have all paper. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but I'm pretty sure you have to have a couple PJ live scoring. So there they would have to change something up there. And then also the, we need to use, our phones to see what the cut line is or 
the na- the non-existent cut line that was at PDJ Live this week. Um, also, if you're trying to win, it's nice to kind of have an idea. Should I lay up for this putt? Should I not? Be very in- interesting to know if Nicholas knew where he stood going up to that putt on 17 for par. But should we be able to use our phones? I think ideally, no. I think it looks weird. I could be the only one, but I think it looks weird. Gannon Burr walking up to his, his winning putt and he's on his phone. Yeah, no, I call, I, call me old fashioned. <laughs> yeah, no, the look, the look is definitely something. It is, it is interesting watching that happen on broadcast. Uh, Brad, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I think the issue relates kind of to the PGA Tour where they've banned things like range finders and they've banned uh, certain green reading tools, and players are using the broadcast as an advantage. And some people, at the end of a long round, which happens on tour. Their phones might be dead by the time they get to the 18th. And so some players might not have that advantage. And so I think because of that, they probably should ban phones, but they have to guarantee that all the scoring is done by maybe a marshal that needs to walk with the card. That lead card had a marshal. Gannon got called on a time violation. So, I mean, if you go back to Waco last year, Kristen didn't know she had a putt to win until she walked up to it. I mean, there's the meme of her, you know, looking at her phone, walking up to her putt on 18. And had she not had her phone, maybe she wouldn't have known that. Maybe she wouldn't have known that the 30 foot putt was to win. And she walked up, drained it. But um, I'm not sure. That's, yeah, that's no, all there, I got. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely give and take there. Um, I think obviously because of the need to have scores, but also what advantages are there sam what do you think on the on the topic yeah i think that it's an interesting question i i don't think that there is any way for the pdga to really get rid of phone use at this point i think it would take too much um infrastructure on their part because you'd have to have a way for every player to tell score on every hole so that's at least one type of monitor on every tee box for players to know where they're standing in the field and I think that that's just way too much for the pro tour to to fund at this point. I don't I don't think that they have it in them. Um, but as far as a competitive advantage, I don't see it really as a competitive advantage. I mean, at most, you're seeing maybe 20 to 30 seconds into the future, assessing your lie from 400 foot down the fairway could be seen as a competitive advantage. But overall, I mean, you're not really seeing much more than you would when you're just walking up to your lie. Anyways, you're getting a 30 second head start, 30 seconds isn't that much you have, I mean, you have that much time to assess your lie from your lie anyways. And so again, viewing it from down the fairway, I don't see it that as really a competitive advantage. I don't, I don't think that there is enough here for the PDGA to come in and say, Hey, this is a big deal. Or for the disc golf pro tour to be like, no, this crosses the line. We need to ban all phones and all competition. Yeah. There's no doubt that the, um, the infrastructure is a, is a hurdle there. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, so I think there's always been a clear advantage uh, when technology is used in sports. Uh, you look at a lot of different sports, they ban uh, technology from the, the sideline, at least phones, at least. Um, at some point, I do believe the PDGA or the DGPT is going to need to set ground rules. Uh, until then, it's allowed. Uh, I don't think Gannon had any sort of advantage going into his putt. Um, he could have just ran up there and used the range finder anyways, as he crested the hill to, to shoot, if he really wanted to, would that have looked better? Maybe I'm not too sure. Um, I think Gannon just chose the option that was easier for him. He pulled out a cell phone, uh, and was able to check the PDGA app and, and see that, uh, where his butt was from, uh, in regards to accessing live coverage and having knowledge from, uh, the booth. I think that's a lot. Um, I think somebody could take this too far. And I know that it's been discussed prior. Uh, you could have somebody that is able to uh, assess the wind and relay that to the caddy of the player. You could have somebody um, just relaying uh, the advantage or disadvantage of rollaways or, or slippery conditions. Uh, I think at some point, somebody's going to take it too far. And ultimately, uh, technology is going to affect the game. Gannon saw how to make the putt, though, and he canned it, and he won. And for right now, I think that's fine. Yeah, Rebuttal I, to Sam. Go ahead. 
My rebuttal to Sam is uh, a little pushback on the idea that we wouldn't be able to find people. We actually have people now, and we also had people last year with UDISC. Now, we're not able to maybe full field for some of these events, not get everyone, but right now we're not putting in in the fairway. Our putts are 23 feet. That's, that's someone is on our card. They actually have bibs now that say scorekeeper on it, which is super nice. So we can see like, Oh, that's not just a random person that's getting close to us. They're actually a scorekeeper. So I think they could do it. And then the other thing I would say is just a little inside scoop on Gannon. Gannon is one of the few players that is super intense on knowing where his disc is at all times. Mm -hmm. He wants to know that he has a 25 foot putt or a 20 foot putt or a 30 foot putt versus just walking up there and figuring it out. This is not the first time that he's like asked or whatever. And now he can just watch it on coverage. I think that the, um, when you have something as versatile as a cell phone, right? The, the mm -hmm. implications of what kind of advantages could be established are endless. Um, it goes from everything to, you know, auditory. We talked about AirPods a lot of times in the show. Like, what could that do for you? If it's even as much as people use a metronome when trying to putt, um, you could use it to time things like that. Your phone has a camera in it. You could have your caddy filming your form mid-round and showing you things. Um, but then obviously there's the idea that you could be using the internet to look up like whatever you want. There's a, there's a lot of implications, but I I think you well, guys are the biggest one is uh is having someone on the inside turn off someone's phone from silence and then calling them <laughs> mid <-putt. laughs> and true. having having their phone ring in their backpack that, that would freak me out if that yeah, if I was putting it's true obviously the infrastructure though is a big issue i mean if you go to a pga tour event they've got giant scoreboards at every single green they've got people holding uh that cards um, or groupings scores right there. So it's net. You're never far away from seeing where all but the you scores know too, are. The masters. It's, it, it's not always the case. There are some holes where you are it's blind true. and you have it, to wait a couple holes to see what the leaderboard is. So it, it is true. It is true. So disc golf is better than the masters. This, we are. Um, <laughs> that's what I heard. That, that's where, that's where <laughs> we're at. Um, but it is, it's going to be an interesting one to see when they decide to pull the plug. Cause eventually they will ban technology. All sports are doing it. It I just makes it looks sense. Bad. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look great. It just makes sense to ban it. Um, when you see a player scrolling through Instagram on the broadcast, it's a weird look. Um, so it'll be a matter of when they decide they're ready to do that. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to the next topic here. So Lake Waco, new course at the event. It was mixed with, uh, met with mixed reactions as a new course on tour, but it's hard to argue with the drama that it produced. How much of a course's likability on tour is impacted by the first impression shown to the fans? Are there bad courses that are held in high regard only because of the memorable moments and good courses that are overlooked because they have yet to have that signature moment or dramatic finish? Brad, what do you think? Well, I think in this case, the drama far outweighed the downfalls. Um, I heard that the tee paths were awful. I heard that the, and I saw that on broadcast, there was some pretty ugly looking lack of manicured fairways and circle ones. Um, these are things in the future though, that can be fixed. They can be brought up to tour standards. And even though they didn't nail it this year, I think the future looks good for having Waco as a four round two course event. And it did provide all the drama needed. I mean, that 16, 17, 18 was electric. Yeah. It was so much fun to watch. I, I was like, chess.com was fun, but this felt like a real electric finish and I really enjoyed it. And there were some well-scored rounds and there were some complete meltdowns. So that, that really provided, I think, the drama needed. There are some courses that are not good and they ended up providing entertainment like the Open at Austin last year, but they went and fixed 16 out of 18 holes. The majority of the course is different. <laughs> It, yeah, it was a bad first impression, right, Brody? I probably but liked it. <laughs> they, uh, they, they improved a whole bunch, or they changed a whole bunch. We don't know if they improved it. We're going to find out. Um, and I can't think of a good course, a course that people truly love that hasn't proven itself with some drama. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, no, I, I think um, Open at Austin is an interesting example. And it also... The fact that a lot of the disc golf courses these days are being put on large properties and even on golf courses, it does give the tour a chance to change things around as they need to. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is interesting. Um, all right, uh, who we got next year? Uh, sorry, I lost my spot on my notes because I put away the wrong page. Uh, Sam, what do you think? Um, I think that 
maybe I don't watch as closely, but I thought that Lake Waco looked like a great course as far as play went. Um, I know it wasn't the most manicured thing in the world. Maybe some of the tee boxes were great. I, I didn't hear that stuff. I thought from a viewer's perspective, it provided great disc golf, and that's what people are watching for. Um, as far as courses that um, maybe aren't held in high regard that are really good just because they haven't had any excitement on them, I don't know that that's really the case. I think a good course shines through in just that it plays hard for people and it provides quality content. It doesn't have to be a super dramatic finish to be a good disc golf tournament. Um, but a course's likability on tour is hugely impacted by fans' first impressions of it. If, if commentators and pros are talking highly about a course leading up to a tournament, during a tournament, fans are going to like it more. It's as simple as that. And, and it comes down to what is called the halo effect. It's where you're, you, know, you, you have this first impression of something, and that's what you're going to go on believing it, and it's going to take drastic change, whether good or bad, to change your opinion on something. Um, and so these new courses that are popping up on tour, I think that as long as they're talked about in a fine light and they don't absolutely blow a tournament, there's not really going to be um, a reason to walk away and, and just absolutely hate them. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with the uh, the way things are talked about has a huge influence on that. Um, Ryan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, so Lake Waco had an amazing finish uh, to the point that while I'm wrangling two kids under four, I'm checking my phone every second I could get. Um, the finish like Waco produced, as well as a constant changing leaderboard throughout the four-day tournament, made it extremely fun as a fan. Uh, seeing names that we all didn't expect to see was great. Uh, seeing brand diversity on the lead card and chase card, uh, it was awesome for disc golf to, to have so many different people and brands represented. Uh, I did really enjoy the addition of Lake Waco to the overall Waco tournament. I think they nailed it. There are some holes that definitely need some help and editing hole six and seven, watching players throw over um, a bunch of trees and poke and hope, watching James Conrad invent literally a new putting style uh, from within the, the circle. Like, I hate that. Um, you, you should be rewarded for a great drive. And, and there are a couple holes, but I feel like every course to a degree has that. There are plenty of courses that are overhyped based on signature moments. Uh, I've had the privilege to play Music City Open, Brewster's Ridge, Maple Hill, represent. Um, and although Brewster's and Maple were absolutely magical, I had just as much fun playing in Tennessee as well. Um, like all things, age brings a sense of nostalgia. And, and we have these magical moments on them. It's hard to not perceive them as good. But these new courses that don't have these, these great finishes and magical moments throughout the years, we're going to find them disappointing sometimes. I know when Champions Cup was new, uh, we were all saying, oh, Oh, it's a new major, but uh, we're kind of disappointed now. I'm a little disappointed it's not IVGC this year. So yeah. I think with time. I, I think, yeah, you said it. You know, the nostalgia is hardest to beat. And I like when people are willing to play courses that are held in such high regard and be transparent about them. All right, Brody, I know you've got a lot to say. So oh, yeah. Right. I've just been writing down a lot of notes <laughs> of what these cats were saying. Okay, so here we go. First <laughs> off, Trevor, you know as well as anyone, courses are not the same from what they look like on TV versus when you get there. We've all gone to courses, or a lot of us have gone to courses and be like, I had no idea this hole was like that. That is on the job of the production team. That is on the job of the commentary team to explain the hole as best they can so you actually can grasp what's going on. They clearly did not do a good job of that because Ryan thinks two holes were poking hope when they clearly weren't. Also, he's claiming that James Conrad had to come up with that tree didn't just show up, Ryan, uh, during the tournament. <laughs> we all knew on that hole, if you were long or if you were right, you were going to have an obstructed putt. The, the idea of that hole was to be short left, short left, and you had a wide open putt. Now, Gannon did get lucky and get through the tree and had a putt. But a good shot there was short left. I think another hole that no one really talked about that much was hole 16. Hole 16 was a very difficult hole to get near the basket. A good shot, and I think the commentary team did okay mm -hmm. uh, explain this one, letting people know that 40 feet left of the basket was a great shot. Last thing, Brad, please tell me what disc golf course is manicured fairways. What are we talking about? Waco, <laughs> the beast is disc like one of heaven? This side of heaven, there's weeds all over the place. There's dirt patches all over the place. What, I mean, what are we talking about here? 
I don't know. I've never been there. I'm from Canada, man. <laughs> I can just hear. Listen, I can just. Everybody, uh, I could just hear all of the things that you guys mentioned in your arguments while our fair arguments I knew were like the opposite of Brody's like buzzwords. <laughs> I just was ready. I was getting ready for him to implode. There's um, one course we play that has manicure fairways, and we pay like ten to a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know actually what the number is, and that's Portland. Portland Open is the only course we play that has man manicure horse? fairways. Wild horse? When you did? You think you don't? Those fairways are good. The wild horse fairways? Oh, bro. That course, that's not a good course, Trevor. For golf, if you went there and paid up, how much money would you pay for play golf there? 50 bucks. You would pay 50 with a cart? Mm. The way I remembered, I thought the fairways were in pretty good shape. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Oh, you played a lot nicer golf courses than I had. <laughs> back, back in Pennsylvania, that'd fetch you a hefty price. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I will say, though, you're right. Like Sometimes courses get are portrayed way different on camera. It also helps when the broadcasters are not even Because they're not site. a golf course. Um, because like Wild Horse, I always thought watching that on tour, for example, Wild Horse looked like fine. But playing it in person, I was like, this course is awesome. This is so yes. much fun. Um, the shots just look different. And, that, and that's... It's not, listen, Brody does have an advantage of some of these things because he's there. You know, we're just fans. We, we see them how we see them. And I agree with you, Ryan. Uh, some of those holes did look like poke and hopes. Like they, that's just the way they, they look on camera. You. Um, it, you know, that's, that's no, just kind of the it, nature of it. I'm so saying, I'm not going after Ryan here. My rebuttal was no, on the yeah, commentary was, <laughs> yeah. and the production. I, I totally understand. This one's on, I, yeah, I can this is on Terry and Nate, man. This Correct. is on Terry and Nate. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our, our next topic here. Uh, talk a little about Kristen Tatar, who did get stuck at 999 again today on, on the ratings. Update. She's just, if she doesn't get it at this point, it's going to be just <laughs> tragic. Um, all right. So week after week, we see Kristen Tatar win with stats that don't always overwhelm in one particular category. A lot of times she may only lead one statistical category, uh, but has these dominant wins. So how much of her dominance at this point do you think has to do with her aura and, and intimidation factor rather than just her level of skill? Is she beating a lot of the players before they even show up to the course? Sam, what do you think? Listen, let's not get it twisted. Kristen Tatar is head and shoulders above her competition at this point. And that's just a fact. She, she's, at a lot of places, she's unbeatable. Um, with that being said, is she beating people before they get to the course? I don't think so. I think she's actually beating people by being on their card. I, I did some numbers. I crunched some numbers. Playing on Kristen's card is a disadvantage. When, when players are, this past weekend, coming down the stretch in round three and four, players on Kristen's card averaged two more bogey strokes per round versus the next most competitive card that does not feature Kristen. That is a crazy statistic. People on her card are throwing two more bogey strokes per round versus even the lead card if she's chasing. And that goes, and I did the numbers, it goes back to even like throw pink last year. It's the same way. People on Kristen's card are bogey more. It's her presence. Her being there, her being consistent is forcing players to take risks that they wouldn't normally take in their game. They're, she's forcing them to push to try to keep up, and they're just not consistent enough to do it. I think that is what's beating people. Kristen is such a nice and humble competitor. She has a calm demeanor, and she's deadly consistent. It's the, worst, it's the type of disc golfer that nobody wants to be on the course with because it's hard to be mad at her for being good because she's so nice and humble about it. She's not one of those in-your-face people who's bragging about it. But just being there and watching her play her game makes her competitors worse. Yeah, hey, I love it. Uh, that's good, good stats to back it up to. You could definitely, uh, definitely argue there's a presence there. Uh, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, uh, short answer is no. Uh, I don't think, like Sam said, I don't think she is is innately intimidating uh, her her competitors. Uh, these women, these women are professional disc golfers, and I find it hard that they completely crumble because solely. Kristen is known for dominating. Um, she's not one to go and chase you down like Paul of late and Ricky. Um, her numbers are not flashy. No, it, it, she's not leading in every category, but she's a heck of a putter um, that sometimes gets overlooked by players like own. And she hits fairways consistently, which sometimes gets overlooked by her European counterparts, Evelina Henna. But where she really dominates is game tee to green. I feel like every tournament she plays, she is leading or top three in that category. And, and, and to no surprise, uh, at Waco, she led tee to green um, at 23.39, beating out Evelina and Henna both, even though Henna had a better C1 and C2 regulation uh, than Kristen. In addition, an astonishing 5.7 gained in C2 behind Holland. Shout out Holland. But... 
that's that's a number that we don't typically think of Kristen. She's just so good at so many things that although, yes, she is dominant, I don't think it's because these players just forget how to play disc golf. I think she's just so consistent and players just can't keep up with her. I think it's her skill that's that is truly beating her beating yeah. her competitors. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, T to green at the end of the day, and especially in the FPO division right now, if you're good T to green, if you're just getting yourself um, to the basket um, better than anybody else, you're going to do really well. We've seen players able to win even when they're not putting well. Um, and her C2 putting, yeah, it is underrated, I would agree. Um, all right, uh, Brody, what do you think? All right, so Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, they were both the goats in their sport. I think they Beautiful. legitimately had an impact on players when they, when they are facing them. I don't see that same impact. I'm going to agree with both these guys. I don't see that same impact with Kristen. Um, I don't think she does have an intimidation factor. There might be something of where there is this narrative in every FPO player's head of where Kristen is better than me and we hear it. She's going to win everything. And there might be something in their head being like, I can't beat Kristen. And they're trying to have to overcome that. I'm not entirely sure if we'll ever get it. I've talked to Missy Gannon on tour life about this a couple of times. It seems like she doesn't really have that mindset, but we also really haven't seen the results to back that up yet from anyone. Right. I think the big thing here is, is Kristen actually just doesn't make massive mistakes. The people that are trying to cr chase Kristen down, you have Hina who will four putt from inside of 15 feet. You have Paige Pierce who will take a 12 on a par four. You have Evelina who sometimes just cannot make a putt to save her life. I think the one person owns Scoggins distance is a problem for her. Missy Gannon doesn't have a forehand. Also distance is a problem. The one player that to me kind of jumps out is either Ella Hansen or Holland Hanley. But with them, I think it's all the mentals. I think that's, we've seen Ella getting, I mean, she lost what, 11 strokes on Kristen going yeah. into, uh, I mean, we've seen it happen too many times. It is what it is. All right. All right. So not, not completely sold on the intimidation factor. Brad, what do you think? I'm going to disagree with all three of you. She's the most intimidating in the field. She's put up the top results of anybody for the last two years. And I think that she is intimidating. She met the prime minister of her country. That's pretty <laughs> cool. It, it's not as uh, it's not as proven as Tiger, like like Brody said. But I think that like in Tiger's time, players felt like they were only competing for second. And I think that the FPO division, as much as they're not going to admit it on a podcast, I think they all know that they're only playing for second. And although her stats aren't crushing anyone in any particular category, being at the top of a lot of stats across the board as she does is what lets her win. She was only putting at 69% circa 1x in the event, but 90% on day four, which is way above her average. And that was the only stat on day four that she beat Hen in, which I found pretty interesting. Um, let's see. So I think Kristen is a really interesting case in the intimidation factor because she has a very professional athletic look and she has sponsorships from companies that these other players don't have anything close to. She has sponsorships from Nike, Porsche, a gambling website. She stands out in the field and she belongs like she belongs and she looks like she belongs at the gala she goes to as well as at the top of the podium. And you know what you never see? Her playing kendama or cards or hacky sacking. She's dialed into the moment and ready to compete. You Damn. already know, rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal. Let's hear it. You got something to All say right. about the prime minister? Br well, Brad's making it sound like every single time I'm playing with someone, everyone's going to be crapping their pants from the people I've met. Uh, that's not the case by any <laughs> oh, means. Oh, okay. I, what a flex, well, bro. <laughs> I'm just saying that the, the people you meet have no, no one's intimidated. That was a side point. No one's intimidated by me because of the people I meet. That's just, that's a crazy accusation. Also, the other thing is they're not Dustin Poirier. You, I'm not having to go up against someone that could literally shut my lights out. If Kristen Attar em, em, embarrasses me, I get to go home and my face looks exactly the same. This is, like Tiger Woods, when Tiger Woods was rolling back in the day, he would throw these roars out. The crowd would go nuts. That's a scary atmosphere to be in. Kristen Attar makes a putt to go up by six. 
she just walks. She is slow. I mean, honestly, that probably pissed me off more because it makes it. <laughs> she makes it seem so much easier. Hey, that was Sam's I don't, point. <laughs> I don't. But it's not an intimidation factor. You're showing up. I have an IQ of uh, 50, and I'm going up against someone that's 150, and we're doing like uh, some sort of trivia thing. I know I'm already beat before I show up. I'm not intimidated. It's, it's, it's a completely it's, different I argument. It's, yeah, I, I guess it's the uh, it's maybe less intimidation. Maybe that's the wrong word. Maybe it's more of a mental block because I think the idea that because she's so good and all the FPO players know she's so good and win so much, it might be that it's less of they're scared of Kristen, right? They're not necessarily scared of her. They just uh, know the reality that they may be playing for second. Um, so, yeah, I think that's fair. I think the word intimidation is a little divisive, maybe, because, yes, Kristen is not scary. No. Um, I don't know if there's I, there's as, as in Serena Williams. Serena Williams is scary. She yeah. is in, she is intimidating. Yeah, to her opponent. There are definitely athletes that and I, I do the Tiger point. That is one Ronda thing. He, one thing that Tiger had, like you mentioned, was the crowd. I do think that was a big part of playing with Tigers. You had 10 times the gallery, 10 times the noise. Um, that could be an effect, though, if Kristen, if there were more, more bigger galleries um, and Kristen, Kristen would drive those galleries like that would be people would go to watch her. Um, so that that is true. You know, she's ahead I of think time. you're going to find Tiger. that. I think you're going to find that at Worlds next year in Europe. Ooh. Yeah, that's true. You got to, uh, for sure. Point. Kristen for sure. Gallery in, in Europe could be crazy. Wait, Ryan, do you have a rebuttal to me? I want someone to rebut me. Not, I, I do all the rebutting <laughs> around here. Well, you're a not, not, a, not a major one, but Tiger Woods, a reason that he had such a crowd and, and the reason that he was able to roar and, and do all that is because he was just head and shoulders better than every other golfer Bill out Mickelson. there on the fairway. And, Bill Mickelson. And, but he was able to do stuff that nobody else could do. And then he would say, hey, I'm going to go do this. And then he did it. And that's why Kristen's not doing that. She's beating her competitors with consistency. And like MJ, like MJ just did things that, that humans yeah. at the time just seemed but, unprobable. But there is I, also I the big them in the, different categories. The big issue that Kristen and the FPO field is going to have is like she needs to have someone. It doesn't have to be the same sure. person, but she needs to have someone that pushes her. She yes. played bad this week. Kristen Tatar did not play good this week. I don't and she, disagree and with she, that. And she won easily. Yeah. Yeah. That that is an issue. Yeah. Yep. It is different. I do I do agree, Ryan. It is different. I think I mentioned this on on Monday, maybe. But you did. the uh, yeah, yeah the idea that like watching tiger we talk about kristen having the tiger effect but tiger did stuff nobody could do um kristen is just doing something that everybody can do but she's doing it better and more consistently than everybody else uh i won't say everything you know she and heck her mental game is good and that's something that some players can't put together so that alone but um, i will say i'll have one more thing i do think if she developed a tiger roar like tiger, you know if she cashed a 30 foot putt and screamed in people's faces she Bro, would win by so many more strokes if she did that like do you, with her she demeanor would people by two would be so strokes. scared it like, would be terrifying <laughs> imagine imagine you're on her card she's coming back like she was down five and she ties it up and she just yells in your face like terrifying oh, put ricky wysocki in yes. Kristen. Yes. <laughs> it would be it would be something i want to see it man i want to see some emotion um all right we're gonna move on here man, it's hard time. when you're like you know i mean i was a camp counselor and we would do the uh if you scored basketball we dropped the rim to eight feet if you scored on me I, I bought your ice cream that day yeah no no one would score on me and it was very very difficult to be like be that's like because super, you're seven feet tall <laughs> yeah. that's the point that's the point and it was very difficult for me to be like <laughs> and I feel like that's what Kristen's doing. It's that's very, fu- it's very hard for her to Kristen, go pump when she's just like, I, I feel bad. I'm just whooping everyone's butt every Kristen week. Kristen is just Brody on a seven foot rim against middle school. Dominating. It's, just, it's Dominating. the same thing. That's the perfect uh, metaphor. Um, all right. We're going to go to the last topic here before the finals. Um, so we've kind of talked about it a little bit, um, but uh, like the Lake Waco course, we're going to get into a little bit more of the theory of the two event or two course event here. So Waco has historically featured just Brazos East Park as the exclusive venue of the event. It's kind of synonymous with that event. Honestly, this year they added the Lake Waco course that I first to diversify the tournament and add more spectator friendly course. Should other one course tournaments be looking to add a second course to lean into the sport of disc golf? and make things more interesting if so what tournaments should be focusing on what should tournaments be focusing on when adding a second course any examples of an event that would benefit greatly from this change um so lots to unpack here but um ryan what do you think 
Okay. Uh, so for the most part, all one round courses should take a second course and become a four day court, a uh, four day tournament. Uh, this produces less fluky winners. Uh, the cream of the crop has time to actually rise. Uh, and in addition to adding a second course, it allows diversification across multiple courses within that tournament. Uh, so often we look at courses like MVP and we think tight wood course. And immediately we think of Dickerson and Matty O that's going to win there. Uh, whereas courses on golf courses, we think Bombers, we think Eagle, we think Barella. But what if we had the perfect one-two punch for every single tournament? Uh, two courses, four rounds. I think this really has a shot to provide a tightly wooded course. I'm not going to say the Beast is perfect example of this, but it provides a shorter, a slightly shorter course with more technical holes and Lake Waco that provides that more open bomber type course. I think the Waco Charity Open did it also perfectly with how they scheduled it with an ABAB schedule. Uh, the cut on day three, although Brody's saying it was questionable on, on that knowledge of where the cut was. Uh, I know they uh, did this for better viewership with putting Lake Waco on the last one, but I think they nailed it. Uh, some courses should not. Winthrop Gold's uh, USDGC, they don't need another one, but most courses they do. It all comes down to money at the end of the day, more course, more tournaments, more time to make more money for the uh, PDGA and DGPT. I, I do think that's definitely a school of thought. Um, you know, a lot of people do want that balanced event. Um, that's definitely one way to think about it. Bertie, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think we should go and look, I won't do a golf reference here. I'll actually go with tennis. I think tennis does a great job with their majors, right? They have clay, spin, they have grass, serve and volley. They have hard court, which is going to be more for the uh, high end serve baseline hitters. I like that. And I think that's okay with disc golf as well. The two court, the two tournaments you actually mentioned there, Ryan, uh, of not changing, those are both majors. And that makes sense. You have a major that's like, hey, there's a lot of OB, there's a lot of trouble. You have a major like Champions Cup that's going to be like, hey, it's in the woods. I like that. I don't think worlds should do that. I don't think there should be a wooded worlds championship. I don't think there should be an open worlds championship. I think worlds is one of the few tournaments that actually does need to have a balance. I actually liked Waco the way it was before they added the second course. I think if the, if they could figure out parking, if they could figure out how do you get more people to watch the tournament in person, I don't think there actually would have been a second course. I think that's the only reason there is a second course is because they, they can't expand the tournament the way it is. So I actually don't think they needed to change it. I think Waco is a wacky tournament. We see winners of, uh, that we would never see. We see people in the top 10 that we would never see. And I actually liked it. I liked the way it was. Um, but obviously they're trying to expand it. It is what it is. I don't like this idea that we have to have a balanced tournament. I think it's okay to have unbalanced tournaments. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's kind of the other school of thought, you know, some tournaments having its own particular identity. Um, Brad, which side of the fence, if either, do you sit on here? I like the two course idea. Um, especially if they're trying to get upgraded to DGPT plus <laughs> these, uh, <laughs> these uh, one course tournaments should be, Rather than trying to add a second course, I think they should be doing multiple pin positions and alternate tee pads on different days. That would make moving day more exciting. It would make the finals more exciting. I mean, the big thing that Jeff Spring said in an interview was that no course on tour can support 6,000 spectators. That's a problem if they want to go forward and move into, you know, um, world notoriety and have more people turn up. The only course that can do that is like the beast in Finland. And even they, I think their cap is 6,000. So I think that, uh, certain things, certain events, uh, would be cooler with two courses. Like for instance, a world's at Milo MacGyver and Glendevere would be really cool because they have a giant city center between them. And they're two very, um, Milo being historical and Glendevere being very well manicured. Um, I think too many four round tournaments would burn out players on tour too quickly. That's a lot of golf to practice. The schedule is absolutely packed. And um, I kind of think world should go back to nine 
rounds and maybe even three courses. Whoa. Whoa. Hot take. Hot That's take. Exact opposite of what you <laughs> hot world's take. Hot world's take. <laughs> Only for worlds, Brody. Only for worlds. It has to be better than the other majors. You got to take time out to after condition. The fourth round. Got to condition. Um, all right, Sam. Wrap it up Just here. One what tournament. do you think? Yeah, I'm going to agree with Brody on this one. And he took the tennis reference right out of my mouth. I oh. think that... Um, <laughs> I think that the majors should be separate in that way. I think that they each should have their own kind of discipline, if you will. Um, but as far as the, the tournaments in between, just on the regular tour, I love the idea of implementing second course. If the course that is our, that is originally hosting is not a good dual threat course, I think that I think of a tournament like Jonesboro. I think that course, it's a little bit, it can get a little bit stale. Um, it's a little bit of a hyzer fest at times. And, and there's not nothing, nothing crazy unique. Now, I will say, I know that I'm close to Jonesboro. I know that they are working on putting in a top tier wooded course on the same property. And it's going to be really cool. I've played it once. It is an absolute beast of a course. It's super hard to play. And I think that that's going to add a lot to that tournament. I think that courses like Jonesboro, like this side of heaven, will benefit greatly from having that second course and expanding to a four-day tournament. Um, I think it will bring some a new perspective. It will let these players try something new. I, I think new courses on tour are always fun as long as the courses are brought up to close to a tour level as they can. I don't, I don't want to see pro tour players coming out to a course that's going to be hard for me but would be an absolute breeze for them. I think that that would be boring. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, Brady, what do you have? Yeah, you already know I got a rebuttal. All right, <laughs> did did uh, Jeff Spring actually say that, that there's only one yep. course on tour? Because I don't think he said there's no He said there's no courses on tour that support 6,000 people. Okay, there might be a dip. I, I don't know if he said support or we actually have had 6,000. OTB can definitely have 6,000 people. Portland Open can definitely have 6,000 people. DDO can definitely have 6,000 people. I mean, Lake Jeff Eureka, Spring probably has done a logistics feasibility study. Lake Eureka study can definitely have 6,000 people. <laughs> You're just <D> saying it. <laughs> these, these, are massive, these are massive venues. Why can't Parking. they have 6,000 people? Can you park 6,000? Like on site? What event can you park 6,000 people uh at a Does lot of, DGPT a lot of, have the money and infrastructure to, to have a shuttle program? They do at MVP. That, there's multiple events where they shuttle in but spectators. Do they, do they bus people or do they? Yes, or do they, they shuttle people in at MVP because okay. there's right, like fair. no parking same with, outside. Um, same with Smuggler's Notch. I don't know. I Smuggler's the bus, Notch, they smuggle times. people it's in. It's Jeff Spring's quote though, so I'd be curious to know what he... Whatever, that's fine. The other <laughs> thing I want to say too, Brad, you know it's really, really hard to... Uh, you're, you're talking about manicured fairways, right? And you want mm -hmm. manicured fairways. You know what's really harder to do? is to actually have Multiple two courses, decisions. have two courses with manicure fairways. If you can't mm. manicure one fairway, add, add another course. That's going to be tough to get two courses manicure fairways. <laughs> That's why I was saying you should focus on some of these three events, three round events should focus on manicuring their fairways, doing better maintenance and adding multiple positions and, yes. and doing all that manicuring will allow you the space to add tee pads. Love the two courses, the positions. two courses needs to be like very minute because also it stresses mm -hmm. the disc golf pro tour super thin with all their assets that they, I think they can't add as many elevated baskets as they want because they're not switching <laughs> elevated baskets from one course, to the other. So there's a lot of limitations by them doing two courses. So it is a lot to me. To me, I think it's a worse product in a lot of instances. Not it, all, but in a lot logistics of logistics wise and infrastructure wise, it is like difficult, like you mentioned, to stretch over two courses. But it's interesting because the the tour seems like it's trending in the direction of adding in more two course events. So I, I it is it's a weird one to know where their heads at there. Um, all right, we're gonna move on Brody, to our final topic. Oh, go ahead. No, go Brody, ahead. Does it, Bring does, it change, does it change your opinion if the two courses are on the same property, where there's less moving around for the pro tour? Like Jonesboro, if they added a second wooded course to that oh. property, which is what they're doing, I think mm -hmm. that that that's all good, no bad. I think I think if the I think if it like adds value, like if it actually makes the uh, the tournament better, then yeah. sure. But I think just adding a course to have a second course, I don't think necessarily is like a good thing. If it, okay, like. Yeah. Nothing changes by them adding a second course as far as parking goes or anything like that for Jonesboro. I think right? it's it's interesting because when you add a second course, 
one of the most important things in, in with these disc golf events is creating an identity and creating nostalgia and having people be like, oh, we're going to Waco? I love the beast, right? Like, that's what you want to happen. 66, 36 so, holes is a lot of holes to remember. Right. So if you're going to add in a second course, it's probably important that these events establish a second course early and keep it because it's it's always hard to remember two courses over one. So if you have two courses that beautifully mesh together, an example, I won't say these courses beautifully mesh, but an example of a tournament that's done this for a long time is Ledgestone, right? Ledgestone's done it long enough that when you say Ledgestone, I know they're going to play Eureka Temp. Um, and I know, obviously, I know the second course they're headed to as well. Um, so the is when tournaments can establish that early, that probably helps. But if you do it too late in the game, that other course might just get forgotten. Yeah, L Las Vegas Challenge, you brought that up earlier. I think that was one of the biggest issues. Oh we, my played, we played three, three courses. Three of them. Three courses in four yeah. days, and the holes just all melted together. And like you just couldn't really get a sense of what... You know, oh my God, they're about to go to this. You had no idea what the next yeah. hole was. No, it's it's so true. And you don't want, another thing is if you have a course that's super beloved, like MVP, and you throw in a second course, you might have people that are like, we just want to see Maple Hill. Like we don't want this other course. It's it's tough to do once a course is really established. But I think if you do it early enough and it makes sense, it works. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the finals. Uh, Ryan, Brad, unfortunately leaving us. I should mention, I forgot to mention at the top of the show, Brad joined with a half an hour to spare. So Brad gets a round of applause because he he had to jump into this and that is not easy Thank to you do. Guys. Um, Hashtag bring ba Brad back. We'll bring yes, Brad will come Thanks, back guys. absolutely. Um, uh, great job, Ryan, as well. But we're gonna move on to the finals here with Brody and Sam. We'll see if uh, the newcomer Sam can take on Brody in the pineapple shirt. Just pulled a five hundred dollar card. Things are looking up. Um, all right, final topic here. Ten points up for grabs for each of you. Brody, would you like to go first or second? Uh. As he reads the question, yeah, uh, <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> uh, let me. Let, I, I stole. I stole Stam's um, tennis take. He so did. Let, I'll. I'll let him go first. So I can't okay. steal anything. Um, all right, we're gonna talk injuries here. So Calvin had to withdraw from Waco with a nagging elbow injury, which is just like the most awful sentence ever. Um, does disc golf have an injury problem? We're seeing more and more star players pick up injuries that dock them time on tour and negatively impact the entertainment value of the tour as a whole. Are these injuries just going to be part of the sport moving forward? Something that all sports deal with uh, that has increased only because of the increased level that disc golf is being played at? Or are the players not taking the necessary precautions to stay healthy? How concerned should the pro tour be about this? Sam, fire away. Okay, there's a lot of questions packed into this one question. Um, is there an injury problem on the disc golf pro tour? I don't think so. I don't think there is yet. Are players doing enough to take care of themselves in the off season? I think definitely not. I think disc golf has this mentality of the only way to get better is to go out to a field and throw, throw, throw. If I want to improve my distance, I'm going to go and I'm going to throw as hard as I can for an hour and my distance is going to get better. I think that is probably leading to a lot of injuries. These players are doing this constantly throughout the off season and they're not giving themselves time to recover. Um, they're not taking care of their bodies well enough. Now, does the disc golf pro tour need to worry about this? Uh, I mean, somewhat every sports organization is going to be worried if their star player gets hurt, but I think that there's a way to spin it for the disc golf pro tour that could play in their favor. I think, I think if the, the disc golf pro tour has the opportunity, I mean, players like Calvin not playing. If, if Calvin came out with a season ending injury, I would hope that the disc golf pro tour wouldn't just write him off as a loss for the season. Say, Oh, we're losing all Calvin fans this season. I think they should be like, Hey, Calvin, what can we do to get you on coverage? What can we do to have you, you know, bring some level of entertainment to it, to the tour without having to play on tour. I think there's a lot of different options down that Avenue that can be explored by the pro tour. Um, that maybe they haven't thought about yet. Um, what is another question? I, again, I, I just don't think that it's something that they necessarily have to be worried about. I think injuries happen, and I think it also produces a lot more storylines going forward. Um, I, and I think that that's a huge part of coverage. It improves coverage when you have more storylines to talk about. So when you have players who are battling injury or coming back from injury, it makes huge storylines. I mean, you could have players, I, I think of Kirk Cousins in the NFL, who was never supposed to play again after his crazy injury. But miraculously, you know, he just signed a huge deal again. I think that if that could happen to like an eagle, he can come back and do great things. Okay. Okay. Not, not an injury problem yet. Players maybe not taking enough care of themselves. Some things to discuss here. Brody, what do you think? I think there's two big things here. One, obviously, there is the idea coming into disc golf. I was shocked with how many people would just park 
And then we're talking to like people that would like drive hours to the next event and they would park, get out, and then like immediately walk to hole one and start throwing. Shocked by that. Also, a lot of times players, as soon as they're done with their round, they go straight into their van or car and drive off. So there is, I've seen a change in that though. There have been a lot more players that have been taking time before and after to warm up. So there is a bit of a shift. The other big shift that we've seen, which I've actually had a little bit of pushback on, but after playing Waco this past week, my body felt completely different after playing the beast beast versus playing Lake Waco, Lake Waco. I was throwing a lot more, um, uh, harder shots m- multiple times playing the beast. There's multiple holes where I'm throwing standstill forehands. So I think there is a shift in the tournaments that used to be on tour or tournaments that used to be played where you're not having to throw as many full shots. So I think that is something that has to get used to. And then I think the third, and this is like the bonus point. I think the money, the money, money, money is coming into play. If I'm, if I'm like a, you know, an up and comer and I'm trying to make it and I've got a little tweak in my shoulder or my back hurts a little bit, or I have a cut on my finger, I'm probably trying to figure out how to play. But if I'm sitting back and being like, wait, I have, I have a six figure contract, whether I play or not. Ah, this hurts a little bit. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So I think that is in, I think that's a smart thing too. I don't think we should be having players that could be making an injury worse like Eagle. I love that Eagle's taking the time to get healthy. I don't think he should be playing, but that I think is a, is a big factor here. That is actually a huge factor. Um, I was hoping somebody bring that up. It, it's no secret that we, the reason I'm even asking, do we have an injury problem is, and should the pro tour be worried is because the star players are the ones that are sitting out. You know, we've had guys like Rick have to sit out for his issues. We've had Eagle have to sit out and now Calvin sitting out. But like Brody mentioned, it is a good thing, right? We should have our players in a stable enough situation. They don't have to force themselves onto the course. You know, we'd hate to see Calvin injure himself further because of an elbow injury that's persisting. So I think uh, the money definitely has something to do with it. And there is a correlation there. So I like that point. Uh, Brody, you are our champion today. Pineapple shirt and all. What do you have to say for yourself? Yeah, I'm going to give rebuttals it, today. Lot yeah, rebuttals. A lot of rebuttals. Well, I mean, you know, that's what the show's all about. We're turning this show into debate night, into rebuttal night. But um, I'm going to take all my time tonight to actually give a big shout out to the man himself, the con man. Connor finally achieved the quest, the journey. I thought it never was going to happen. After an hour of the live stream this past, what was that, Monday? Yesterday. I think it was, I guess it was yesterday or it was Monday when this show is uh, airing. Yeah. Um, after the last hour, only two attempts actually hit metal. And I was thinking, is this man ever going to leave this T pad? <laughs> um, he somehow persisted. He somehow continued to do it. And I'm glad too, for my sake, because I think people actually started thinking I actually hate Connor. Um, so I can <laughs> drop, I can drop the, uh, Stabbing him a little bit with the fact that he never aced hole three at Peaks View. And uh, we can see what his next quest is because he's two for two. He broke 86 and now he aced hole three. So the man's man's on a mission. It has been a big stretch of time here for Connor. Just just overcoming all of those obstacles. Um, All right. So if you are watching debate and you're thinking, I've got something I want them to talk about here. We actually have a QR code here on the screen that you can go ahead and scan and submit a topic. There's also a link in the description if you want to do that as well. We're always looking for new topics. Please, 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 if you have something you think would be interesting for us to talk about, just throw it in there. Even if you're not sure if it's great, just do it. I'll look at them all. And um, we'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Um, Other than that, we will see you next week with another episode.